Hey, how are you doing? I'm great, my brother. How are you? I am fantastic. Am I supposed to look man. at the camera or? No, you can look at me. I can look wherever. <laughs> you can look wherever you want. <laughs> There's a beautiful sun outside. You can look there as well. <laughs> it's great, man. I haven't spoken to you like this in what two years, three years. Two years, now? two, three years. Yes. Yeah. So you almost didn't get to see me. I mean, I, I almost died in 2020. Yeah. COVID, one. isn't it? Yeah, COVID hit me pretty hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Coma, intubation. So I've been taking the last year or so to recover. I'm about 90% back on my feet properly. You know, still got a lot of long COVID uh, issues, but you know, yeah. I thank God that I'm here to talk to you guys, man. Yeah, that's great. It's yeah. great to see you. You look good as well. Uh, your energy is up. Energy is up yeah, right now. Yeah, energy thank is up. God. I remember. So I think it was a, a video and your voice was your... No, I actually talked to you a few weeks after. Yeah. And your voice was, yo, yo. This yeah, is so when they, when they put the tubes down your throat, right, it damages yeah. all your vocal cords and stuff. So for about six to seven months afterwards, you're still, like, swallowing razor blades. Uh, so wow. a, lot, a lot of prognisolone and dexamethasone, all these hormones and um, steroids they have to give you to try and kill the inflammation. And yeah. It does hectic things to your body. Um, yeah. But you know what? COVID, uh, COVID is not a disease. It's a terminator. Uh, <laughs> If it gets you, it gets you, right? And it gets, I mean, it gets 1% of the population. I mean, sadly, one of those guys who uh, Delta really got pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, my wife got COVID. It was barely a cold. She suffers more from a cold than when she got COVID. <laughs> um, so it's one of those things that, you know, it's, uh, it's something that humanity has to deal with, obviously. It's now part of our lives. Yeah. I'm now quadrupled vaccine. I think I've got my Sinopharm. And I also got the AstraZeneca. So I, I should be... You know, I shouldn't now, get so sick you, if I, <laughs> if I get it again. again. Oh, I probably got it already and I didn't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not yeah, better, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. It's good that you're, that you're actually fine. But yeah, for, for people who are... So we're going to touch on that a bit more later on. Like cool. you talked about long COVID and whatnot. But for people who are just tuning in and they're like, who the hell is this guy? Yeah. Um, so I'll tell you my perspective, man. I, I've known you for about four... Since 2018, yeah. uh, Be The Change campaign. Yeah. So I've known you since then. At that time, it was politics. Yeah. And then uh, 19, I think, 2019, if I'm not mistaken, is mm. when you started to move into e-commerce. Yeah. And from the outside looking in, people are like, man, this is a brash guy. Um, very vocal, very opinionated. Yeah. Um, how do you see yourself? How would you like describe yourself? Away from those like tags that people put onto you. Look, I'm generally quite an, uh, an introvert, believe it or not. Um, what the internet has done for, I think, all of us is given us an ability to uh, to shield ourselves from our introversion uh, yeah. by giving us outlets like you know Twitter, Facebook, etc. So we can we can maybe give our opinions and, and so forth. So uh, I I do get that people fi some people may find me polarizing you know, or, or controversial yeah. or whatever <laughs> but at the end of the day I mean there's a consistency to it in the sense that um, I genuinely believe in freedom of speech I'm a libertarian at heart um, I genuinely believe that human beings are multifaceted can change their minds I mean uh, you know people try to convince me that Tupac is the greatest I believe Nas is <laughs> But you can change my mind, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I believe Jay-Z won the battle. I, don't, I think Nas lost. You can change my mind, right? Um, so I, I, and the thing is, I think what, what's happening in a world where people have to be rigid and, and hold positions, people like me are not necessarily easy to deal with because yeah. um, I don't necessarily sing to everybody's particular tune yeah. Um, yeah. to be cool, right? Because I don't feel like I need to be accepted uh, and this is purely because I'm a digital immigrant, right? Unlike some of your, you guys are digital citizens. You're born here, yeah. right? You're born in a space where everyone is synchronizing and watching what you're saying and you have to be cautious about this and that. I grew up in a world where um, initially we could say whatever we wanted, right? We didn't, yeah. there were no cameras everywhere. There wasn't, so you could have an opinion, you could <laughs> change your mind, you could, you know, you didn't have to hold a particular line, right? You can be anti-abortion and you know, pro-LGBT pro rights, right? There's a bunch of gray areas that humanity can be, and you don't have to be one or the other. This polarized left or right is, is something that I try and fight in, in, on my timelines and try and show people that, you know, look, you, you, you can love Chamisa, but you don't have to like sanctions on Zimbabwe because, you know, yeah. <laughs> in the tech space, we deal with it daily, right? You can, you can be absolutely anti-corruption, but still have friends who are Zanu-PF, right? Yeah. I, a, we, we, we can't be one of these 
societies where everything has to be like left or right, white, yeah. black or white, you know, it, it, that's dangerous when humanity cannot allow uh, multiple opinions and voices. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just to sum up who I am is like, if you, if you know me, you would know that you know, I try and be a fair guy, I try and be a good guy, deeply flawed, I fuck up sometimes, I try and apologize, I try and introspect, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I'm a father of five kids, I got a beautiful wife, you know, um, yeah. I'm a divorcee, so I'm a co-parent as well, uh, you know, I try my best to have a decent relationship with my ex-wife, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's fucking <laughs> terrible, <laughs> you know, so genuinely speaking, if you look at me and you look at yourself, you should, you'll find that we're very similar. Yeah. We're multifaceted. Uh, I just happen to show people the multiple sides, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, yeah. So before we actually get to touch um, what you do, one of the things I've seen people say on Twitter is um, you shouldn't be so vocal because that will mess up the bag. So I want to ask you directly, do you yeah. think it messes, do you think your bag would be like two, three, four times bigger if you were like, um, yeah. If you're more passive on Twitter, or is that it's just people talking yeah, yeah, yeah. like people um, do? Yes, I mean, look, capital is absolutely shy, right? Money is a shy thing. It doesn't shout. It doesn't like fanciness and all this. And when you see, when you see, um, uh, you know, when you see quiet people like Strive Masi or whatever else, when you see them, they, they can amass a great amount of wealth and stuff. But it, it also depends on how, what you, what your conscience looks like, right? So I'm not one who can see injustice and just keep quiet because it'll because I'll alienate some guy who then doesn't buy a box of veg. I mean, fuck him, right? It's, yeah. a, it's better to, to, it's better to say, uh, it's better to be, to stand with the truth than, 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 than to, to hide in the lies, right? Uh, yeah. For the sake of money. Money is not my main motivation, right? I'm an I'm a, I'm a experientially motivated human being, right? And I, I guess my privilege, I'm a privileged man that uh, I, come, I didn't come from, um, I didn't come from unhappy people, right? Yeah. Uh, and I and I said and I chose those <laughs> words carefully. My, 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 what my, does that mean? My my fam my my parents. You know, I was born in Bari. There was times when there was no food in the house. There's times when we were struggling. Then my dad got a scholarship and went to Australia with the family. And my parents used to work two three jobs. And we used to do paper runs to to, to just eat in our house. But yeah. in all that struggle, there was no sadness. Like it was it was we, we were a happy family. We loved each other. We supported each other. My dad allowed me to be as, you know, I wanted to be a rapper in 1988. He was like, all right, cool, man. You know. Was he with it? He was, of course. You know, he's, he's, just, he's a man of the cloth. So he says, okay, cool. Let me buy you a Christian rap album to listen to, right? Uh, this other stuff is bit bad, right? So, yeah. so in, in the sense that uh, I'm, I'm confident that um, being myself has not been bad for me. Um, I don't go to bed at night being uh, upset that I lost a customer because I said something was not right. Um, I believe that I have a very strong support base and follower base and customer base who actually likes sometimes my uh, my honest Indeed. appraisal. <laughs> yeah. So even in our companies and, and fresh in a box and fresh ideas, etc., we we don't hide away from the truth, right? We yeah. you know when things are going crazy in the country, we tell our customers, dudes, things are crazy. How do we work together to get to your houses cheaper? Fuel has gone up, you know. Yeah. I need to put up the prices of delivery. You know, we, we always communicate, and I think that's been, uh, that's been a blessing as well uh, as the curse of would I be richer? Probably. You know, I think uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a man of many mischievous skill sets. I'm talented in other things, and I could almost keep my head down and just get money. But then what for, right? I, I don't think I would enjoy life in that space. Yeah, mm. yeah. I hear that. I hear that. I mean... I hope the people on, on Twitter are answered. <laughs> well, I mean, look, put it this way. Every, there, there's nobody who is better than me in any way that has ever had any criticisms of me. There's no boardroom in Zimbabwe that I can't sit in right now. Yeah. I sit on many boards right now, uh, esteemed boards, right? And I have never had to change myself in any way <laughs> to, uh, fit. to fit in, yeah. right? I, 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 I've sat with CEOs of the biggest companies in the world. I've... I've spoken in, at, at, at huge conferences next to billionaires, and you know, so so I'm blessed, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, so when <laughs> when somebody who is sitting there says, "You talk too much, you get more money," I'm like, "Cool, you don't talk too much. How much do you have?" <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, 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 thanks. But yeah, now let's come to um, fresh in a box. Yeah. Um, 
how did that come about? Like, how do you, because I asked this question, um, because Zim is a weird place, right? Yep. Uh, for many people, uh, there's like a bunch of people who see the opportunity of the internet, mm. and there's a bunch of people who don't. Don't. They, for them, that doesn't exist. Yeah. They're stuck in their ways, right? Mm. Uh, how did you come to see that there was an opportunity for you to like sell veggies direct to consumer? How did that happen? It happened out of desperation. Um, you know, uh, I was coming out of the 2018 election. Yeah. Um, we had lost. Uh, and you know how these things work, right? Uh, if we had won, it would have been great. Uh, we lost. Um, <laughs> And, and because I had lost, uh, I, I was running uh, uh, my Begun Sun Media company for a while since this 2010. And I had great clients. I'm, you know, some of the biggest, you know, brands in Zimbabwe were, were def on our client base. And, and apart from working directly with brands, we used to also work a lot with agencies. Because, you know, like I said, we have very particular skill sets, you know, with animation, web, you know, um, app development, etc. Mm -hmm. So after the election, because I was so invested in, in the politics, um, and we had lost a lot of our clients. So going back to your point of yeah. being too vocal, you're seen as political, um, you lose a lot of your clients because they sometimes don't want to be politically uh, aligned. aligned, right? Yeah. Especially since we lost, right? <laughs> um, uh, it would have been better if we had won. We'd say, yeah, great, we work with this guy, he's a winner, right? But yeah. we lost, right? So um, we, we needed to make a plan. Um, and, you know, we had a tomato project that was happening and we needed to find a way of selling these tomatoes. And I promise you it's hard uh, when you're coming into the market. Yeah. Uh, the middlemen, the makoronyera, niggas say, go to Mbari and sell your tomatoes, you get there, it's like impossible. Because <laughs> like everybody's got their own cartels and things going on. So we had to disrupt and find a new way of doing things. And one thing I was always good at was mobilizing my following. Uh, and my following is very similar to me, right? Uh, not necessarily a guy who doesn't drink, but, you know, he'll go to church when he has to. Um, <laughs> It doesn't mind smoking and drinking uh, flawed yeah, individuals, yeah. but genuinely, you know, human. And, 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 and these people are people we approach first. You know, my following on Twitter, I said, guys, I've got tomatoes. I'll drive it to your house. And I think that's how it started. Simply, yeah. no logo, no company name, no nothing, right? Yeah. And a lot of people just said, yeah, cool, my guy, I like tomatoes. I buy them every day. Come drop Come me through. off some and give me a good price. And all. So that's how it started. And immediately, other farmers who were quiet... Uh, hit me up in my inbox and said, dude, I also have lettuce. I've got aubergines. I got this. I got that, right? And so I was like, cool. Bring it to my house in the morning by six and we'll pack it in a box and then when I'm doing my rounds, I'll, I'll take it to people, right? And quickly, the skill sets that I told you about before that were being leveraged for other clients started to work for me um, mm -hmm. in the sense that, shit, we need to do 50 deliveries today in multiple places in the area. How do we do it? Google API, you know, smart routing. Let's, you know, yeah. bit of code, bang. We can now route and, and how many routes do we need? Okay, cool, multiple routes. And start writing, start writing more and more great code to try and help this new little fledgling business, you know? Yeah. Um, how do you communicate on mass with people about the needing, the, you know, how do you automate WhatsApp? How do you automate messages? Yeah. So we just started really working towards being more and more efficient in delivering veggies. Uh, and veggies are hard to deliver because they need to be cut fresh. They need to get to people's houses too firm and great and taste good. And at the same time, um, people are very picky. You know, people are used to touching their own veggies when they're shopping. Yeah. So if you make a mistake, you, there's a lot of customer service that has to get into. How do you fix your screw ups? How do you assist, um, you know, customers who are finding it difficult to order on the app, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so as all that was happening you quickly start to move from a company that's selling 250 veggie boxes a day to a company that now deals with the technology of managing that type of uh, volume and scale, right? Yeah. Um, and then that's where we sort of spun off the Fresh Ideas team because it was now like, this is needed for others, right? We need to be able to deliver pizzas. We need to be able to deliver water tanks and so on and so forth. And that's how the company sort of grew from being a veggie company to being a data company to being a tech company. Yeah. Um, uh, and as you, I mean, I don't, I don't go to Fresh in a Box anymore. Um, you know, it's got a very solid team who, even when I was sick, uh, managed to keep the, you know, the, the yeah, ships right. flying, the solid, loyal customer base that now cannot go into a spa. 
or a pick and pay because the veggies are not the same, right? They're, they're not, uh, you know, so I, I hang out at the farm a lot. We've got our internet there. I, I work with my team virtually a lot. Yeah. Um, and we, we, we're pushing in that direction. So that's how the, the company started. It was out of desperation. <coughs> and then it actually opened up a multiple other uh, uh, yeah, um, avenues for us to keep operating up. Yeah, so at what point did you turn that into a business? Because um, when you were doing the deliveries and whatnot, uh, had you already done the costing? Was it like making nah. sense in terms of a business or it was just, I need to get these off my hands? And we needed to get the tomatoes off our hands. Um, At what point did you realize that, okay, now we, we could actually scale this and this becomes a thing? Okay, so after we'd thrown away 300 kgs of tomatoes and basically watching our greenhouse project, we spent five... Throw it away like trash. We had to throw it away, yeah. We couldn't find anyone to buy it. Um, you know, you, you, you go to buyers at short shops and they've got friends and family and other people, they're already in there. So, so t we couldn't even sell the tomatoes to, to the main supermarkets, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, when I started selling directly to people, I was now in a weird space where, okay, so the shop was offering me um, 300 RTGS per kg, but I can sell for a dollar per kg directly to, to, to Farai, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Um, and Farai is willing to pay me in cash or in my PayPal, right? And it, it didn't take more than three weeks for us to realize, okay, cool, we can actually shift our product uh, until our greenhouse was empty and now we had other people not, and, the, and the demand was lot. Do you guys still have veggies? Do you guys still have veggies? That's when we realized, okay, God, let's give this guy a name, uh, let's give it a logo. I mean, we took two minutes to design the logo. We're like, fresh logo. We're like, two, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> there was yeah. no real thought to it because yeah. uh, the people didn't care about the brand and the logo and the look. They wanted just to, to keep service. getting the, the service. Yeah. And immediately, because we allowed PayPal and stuff, something, uh, something else incredible happened is that we now started getting people sending us emails or calling me and saying, I, I just bought a box, but can you take some mealy meal and some, uh, some cremora and some cooking oil to my mom as well in Budirido, right? So yeah. like, okay, cool. So we're now doing this weird thing where we're like, we'll pack the veggie box, take the driver to go buy spa and buy this and then go and deliver Kawan. And we realized quickly that, oh, oh my gosh, we're now doing a larger volume of shopping than we are doing mm -hmm. on vegetables. Because yeah, yeah. there was a whole missing link between diaspora and being able to send food to their parents or their loved ones, their kids, etc. And it, it was, that was about for a month, right? December. And we're, getting, we're buying more and more chickens and stuff for people. Who, so it's almost like, geez, we, we need to find a way of automating this too so that we, we, can, um, we can take these people's monies. And because we're buying so much chickens from people like drummers, they were not giving us volume discounts and all these things. So these things are also becoming profitable. Yeah. Um, so yeah, about a, about a month later, we discovered that, cool, Zimbabweans love sending money to Zimbabwe. It's a billion dollar industry of remittance. But they're also tired of sending money because Mama then phones after two weeks what it means Zara. Maria is Maria Maria is Maria So sending food, sending food once a week was a guaranteed way of making sure Gogo's eating, daughter's eating, etc. Um, yeah. And there's no but there's no lo lo leakage of the cash. Uh, we were just making sure we deliver the food directly, and that was that was eye opening. So by December now, when when our diaspora side kicked in. Yeah. Um, it was This is it was amazing. December of 2019. 2018. 2018. Yeah, December okay. 2018. That's when the dash. So we, our app was simply an eco cash app. Like it was an eco cash simple button app, right? Yeah. So we didn't put in eco. So we actually ended up using another service for the diaspora. So people would come on the site and see two buttons, local or diaspora. And now everyone started using the diaspora link because they had more stuff. Uh, and that's when we thought, okay, cool. We have to revamp the whole app and make sure that we incorporate everyone Everything. at once. Yeah. yeah. So this is 2018. Going into uh, 19, yeah. Yeah, going into 19. 19, I assume you're still growing at like a, a great rate, right? But it was stupid, actually. It was crazy. So one of the things I've heard then is that um, COVID, people say COVID did like great things for e-commerce. Yes. You run an e-commerce business. Yes. What, what's your perspective on that? Like, it's, what it's changed? A gift and a curse, right? So... Yeah. Um, you're comfortable with your daily orders. You know, 250 ish on a good day, a month end, like, you know, daily orders, right? Then all of a sudden, the president shut down the country, right? Now, we, we had foresight in the sense that we were already sort of PPE'd up. We were the guys who had masks on in February and people were laughing at us. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> so we're ready for the for the for the for the COVID wave. Yeah. We had already sort of got the warehouse team at the farm in sort of like a dorm style, so that we were all sort of isolated, try and make sure that we keep the company going. Because we saw what's happening in China, we saw what's happening in Italy, etc. So COVID hits, we were the only company that was really prepared to keep going. Yeah. And we were immediately given sort of special um, access to the roads and stuff whenever and also shut down as an essential service. So but what we weren't expecting was the growth, right? We thought we'd be servicing our customers yeah. and continuing, but we weren't expecting the explosion. Uh, and the explosion was bad. Uh, I'm talking... <laughs> From 250 to what? 250 orders daily. Okay, so, okay, so on the first day, uh, I remember that day, I, I think it was 3,000 orders done through the system, right? Um, and our system was not trained for that. It was... Yeah, that's we, what I was going to ask. It was not Did trained for the that. capacity... The, so the, on the tech side, on the tech side, we had built it to be quite scalable. So you know, digital yeah. ocean and cloudinary. So, but all of a sudden, the free cloudinary expires, right? It's like, oh, <laughs> you've used too many gigs of your of, of, of image image compression. Yeah. Pay you two hundred ninety nine dollars per month for image hosting. Like what? <laughs> you know what I'm um, saying? <laughs> digital ocean, more more droplets. You know, we now had to do a lot of devopsing to make sure that we could. Uh, manage the load. I mean, we've got a million hits. Yeah. A million hits. Because all Zimbabwe are not sharing. Oh, no, if you want to chop it, just use these guys, right? Um, so we get all these orders, and obviously we don't have the capacity to deliver that many. Right? We didn't have. So we had to dig deep and find, you know, Mutuma Messenger, you know, Link to link Load. To load uh, remember, yeah. You know, I think we had Windy Taxis. We had, you know, anyone. We, we even called Munch, a competitor, to just, yeah. like, we need all your bikes. Because the restaurants are closed, so like all your bikes. So it's like this is hundreds of cars, and we're packing as fast as we could. And we were having to assist farmers get produce from where they were because they were also shut down. So yeah. um, the system started doing weird things, right? Um, so the system, so the, the dev guy, my main dev guy is, uh, at the time was Cyprian, and he was now doing things like, okay, cool, when it gets to this much per day, it moves to the next day. And when it gets to this much, it moves to the next day. It moves to the next. So when people were not coming on the site, they were not giving you three weeks delivery dates. You know that weirdness. So yeah. you come on the site, like, I want to order this for my family because you know, it's locked down. And then the delivery date that is not offering you is in three weeks' time. Because that was yeah. the only way we could manage the amounts of deliveries oh, we could do. Um, and so we had to now start to fix the system as, we, as, the, capacity of, as the capacity of cars grew. We yeah. could now do more orders in a day. So now we had to try and find a way of reversing the system. Say, okay, cool, let's bring... So now we had people ordering today who were getting, yes, tomorrow's date, but people who ordered a week ago getting two weeks' days. So we had to find another equally breeding. That's we ended up doing double deliveries. Ah, I mean, fuck, we lost a lot of money. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but we, I assume you also made a lot of money. Or yeah, 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 yes. We, we made, but we lost. I mean, so yeah. uh, we had to end up buying new trucks and whatever. But then at the end of the day, we equally breeded. About after a month or so, everything sort of got a nice balance. And the lockdown yeah. goes away. So now you have all this crazy capacity of all these drivers who are now used to, to, to doing all these deliveries and all of a sudden you're like, ah, we're back to where we Going used to be. So it's just like, oh God. Um, so a lot, a lot of drivers, again, were no longer on our books. I mean, fortunately, it's a lot, sort of like, it's a gig type of thing. So yeah. they can come in. But a lot of drivers not phoning or just showing up to work. It's like, no, no, we don't have, it's like, it's gone back down to, to normal type thing. Um, so it was a gift in that sense. It taught us how to really scale up. Um, but also, it, it was also a false sense that we've now grown to this. And if we had stayed in that, that trajectory, I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here today. I'll be in, San, <laughs> I'll be in Santon somewhere. But, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was really good. And another great thing for our other startup, which is the Fresh Ideas guys, is that everybody yeah. now knew that they needed to be online and at least be ready. Um, so... We helped hundreds of companies get from just being physical stores to being virtual stores. Yeah. And, and the honest truth is, some of these stores are not functioning at all. Some of them get zero orders. Uh, and that's been a pain for me. Because it's almost like during the lockdowns, these stores really fire. And after lockdowns, people go back to their to the normal business. Habits, yeah. yeah. So I think Zimbabwe is now ready for online. Um, as far as all the shops that I know, uh, are now online ready, uh, but Zimbabweans are not yet using the consumers. The consumers are not yet ready um, to, 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 to bridge that. So, out of all the sort of companies that we are sort of uh, that are ours, our biggest ones obviously Fresh in a Box, which is the, you know FMCG products, yeah. uh, Surprise in a Box, which is 
you know, gifts, cakes and stuff, which is a lot of diaspora buying gifts and stuff for girlfriends, yeah. brothers, sisters, etc. Um, and um, that's it, you know. Bottle store, we shut it down. What happened to that? I just, we didn't need to compete with liquor deliveries and all these other guys because people were now able to go on, right? And it, we just had to fold it back into fish in a box. It worked very well during the lockdown because okay. we were the guys who were bringing the booze <laughs> to your crib. Um, but after, after lockdown, it trickled down to two or three orders, so there's no need to have a separate app uh, yeah. for that. So if you want to buy booze, just use the normal fish in a box app. And I think we're learning to consolidate our, our, our properties onto one app as well. The only one that we won't sp we won't fold into fresh in a box app is surprise because it's so different. It's just flowers and stuff, and there's different delivery structures. And you know, yeah. sometimes someone wants a flowers delivered now and are willing to pay fifteen dollars delivery charge. You know, so you try trying to do too many things on one app is a problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's why we so diversified. However, I mean, if you know if you if you see what the bottle store app was and the fresh in a box app is, they're the same app. It, yeah, we, we've, I've seen it yeah, we've literally just just different colors. It, you literally you you slide the different color, you upload a different logo, and you then launch and then you send it to the app stores. It's, it's not yeah. a it's not a hectic process. Um, so if we need to spin off and do new apps, we can do that quickly, which is why we offer that to other customers as well. So Joey's, we could just spin off and do a pizza app, and if someone wants to sell wings, we can just spin it off. So uh, it's quite an easy way of. Um, Deploying, deploying uh, online tech. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So that that's maybe the business side of, of COVID, isn't it? Um, there's the personal side, like you said, you came down with it. Yeah. Pretty hard. Does that does something like that change your approach to like business or life in any way? Like. Of course. I mean, um, I went down on Christmas Day, two thousand and twenty. Yeah. Um, by new by Christmas by new, by by sort of New Year's Eve. I was now at 60 sats on my oxygen. I was dying pretty much. Uh, and all the doctors would come to the house and the nurses, I mean, they'd failed to keep me alive at this point. So now I had to go to the hospital. Now, my wife is hectic and frantic. My parents are hectic and frantic. Everyone is, I'm dying. So there's a, and, and frustration in a box at this point is on recess until the 6th of Jan, right? Yeah. Um, what we didn't anticipate was certain really important things that we didn't anticipate that Kuda is going to be in a coma on the 6th of Jan. <laughs> and the PayPal yeah. account is on his phone and his computer. The Stripe accounts are linked to his phone and his computer. Uh, the, you know, the Google Authenticator to access our international bank accounts. Yeah. Our Everything is, kind is, yeah. of dies, lives and dies. Well, well that's the problem. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and I was, uh, I'd be myopic to this point because... It always worked out well, right? I would wake up in the morning, I'd check the paper, I'd say, okay, cool, move this one, this account, move this, this account, over to Stripe, see what's settled, okay, cool, settle this, and settle this. Uh, we need to do a refund, boss, okay, cool, refund this client, you know what I'm saying? It's an easy way, you know. I, was, I, was being, I thought I was being modern, but at the same time, I, 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 it, it, I, I almost killed the business. Because yeah. it's almost like they start, they start the business like, okay, cool, all these orders have come in, the cash has come in all over the world, we now need the cash to do procurement. We need to move forward. And uh, how do we get in? Ah, it's on Kuda's phone. Ah, <laughs> Kuda's in a coma in St. Anne's, right? <laughs> so it really hurt the business the first week of opening. Uh, and then Noma and the team managed to get around it. I, you know, they just, I, I don't know who they had to borrow, borrow, rob, and steal from to keep the business going up until I came out of the coma around the you know, end of Jan. Uh, and that's when we came out and we learned quickly that, look, uh, the business cannot run because of Kuda. Or lack of Kuda, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's almost like we immediately set in processes to make sure that we decentralized the, the fish in a box structures and the fish idea structures and everything. I mean, if there's even a problem with accessing the app stores to update the app, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was the guy who used to get the thingy on my phone to, to upload the, you know, on, 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 on Apple Store and all yeah. these weird things. So immediately we had to sort of break down the systems to make sure that it never ever relies on one person. Uh, it now, it now, I don't have to go to fresh in a box anymore. I don't have to be involved in daily operations. No mind the team can handle that. Uh, no mind sometimes can let Rufaro handle that, right? So it no longer is me alone uh, yeah. who, who who controls the money. There's multiple people in our international bank accounts now, and all this kind of stuff. So all that is now sorted. Uh, and now the learning is you must make your business run without you. you, you it can't just be 
you controlling everything. You've got to be able to make sure everybody, who, who trusted members of your competent team, can, can also run. So that was a big yeah. lesson uh, from the COVID. Uh, another thing I learned was that you know, your, your health is your wealth, right? I couldn't walk up four stairs, right? That's how bad I, when I came out. I couldn't talk. Um, and I built a lot of relationships with suppliers on my personality, you know. Um, uh, I built a lot of relationships with good suppliers or meat suppliers, whatever, by being cool and, you know, deals under the table, yeah. you know, compromises, all these kind of things. And, and by doing so, it works really great because it's like you made a deal with this guy, you pay him in US even though it's not allowed, but then there's, uh, you can, you, but then you will invoice you RTGS. These are all important things. But then when Kuda got sick and some of the people you made deals with have now left companies, new people come in and they don't understand what's going on. Why was this invoice in RTGS? <laughs> well, this so these guys now owe us money. So I came on now we owe twenty four thousand to a meat supplier. All these weird things are happening because the the deal the broker was, it was no longer there, right? And, yeah. and and also some some of the suppliers freaked out. You know, if Kuda dies, you know they've just been selling at Christmas. We supplied them this much, many thousands worth of stock. What's and gonna what's going to happen if he dies? And you know. And these are real issues. So now, by the time I came back, I looked at the app and like, Jesus, guys, where's the meat? Where's the, where's the groceries? What's happening? And, oh, no, these guys, have, they said that we have to pay before we do this and we have to do this, but the, the amount was locked in your account. And so all that, again, has been sorted. Right? And so, this is like at a time where you really like can't do like heavy sick. lifting, isn't it? You're sick as hell. So it's almost like we had to now do, I mean, I had to put on a brave face around May times and walk and visit our suppliers and, re-energize relationships and yeah. and then now go with teams to make sure that there's, there is a there's there is, another there's other people with involved <laughs> uh you don't cut deals anymore with handshakes everything must be on paper there must be email trails so you could advise is like okay these this was our agreement at the time this is how it's moving forward yeah. um and these are really important lessons i mean i, I will have to write a book about how to <laughs> To, you know, to not kill your company by being yeah. too central in its, uh, in its organization. Yeah, I think, I think that's extremely important, especially in our context where we're not exposed to these things, so yeah. you never know until like, you're in a situation like that. I'm in a like bad that. situation yeah. now. And at that point, it's, your family is either effed or you're effed or everyone's effed. Everyone's effed, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's messed up. Yeah. But you also mentioned, uh, at the beginning, you mentioned uh, long COVID. Yeah. Um, what, take me through that. Well, what are you going through? Um, so you come, I came out of jail and I, I couldn't feel like my legs. Jail? It's jail. <laughs> uh, Freud and slip. <laughs> Are you trying it to tell me felt, something? It, it felt like jail. <laughs> I, and, Maybe you're okay, trying to so, tell me something. <laughs> let, let me explain to you why I, I, it sort of felt like jail. Um, yeah. You wake up out of a coma, right? And your, yeah. br your brain does amazing things to keep you alive and keep you sane. And some of the things that it does is it, it makes you forget. Right? You... It files certain memories deep into subconscious and all these kind of things. Yeah. So you wake up and you're in jail, you're in hospital, right? And then <laughs> yeah. you got these people who you can't, you don't see their faces. Remember, humans we we socialize to see each other's faces, expressions, etc. Yeah. So you wake up and all the people around you, they have no name tags, whatever. They're in full military PPE, like I'm talking white on white, all the way goggles. You're seeing eyes through yeah. thick goggles, right? Because they're trying to protect themselves from COVID, yeah. right? You don't have people next to you that you can talk to. You don't have uh, social interactions. There's no TV. There's nothing. So you don't know what day it is. You don't know how you got there. You yeah. can't really understand what they're saying to you because they're muffled because they've got like, you know, yeah. these M95 masks on. Um, you can barely talk, right? You haven't had water in your mouth for a month. And you're thirsty as hell, and all these kind of things. And these people are scared to get COVID. And <laughs> they've given you a catheter, but but then you know, so you don't even know that you you know, you don't even know that you're pressed because you're, you're all these weird. So you know, you're in a weird world. You're like, how the fuck did I get here? Yeah. Who am I? What's going on? Whatever else. And these people keep trying to tell you about things, and you just like, I have no context of this. What's, so no one comes to you and says, Ah, my name is Tatsiwa. You got down the disease called COVID, which is ravaging the world. It's a pandemic. Um, you, you, you got very unwell, so we had to intubate you, and you've been in a coma. Um, you, you know, you, nobody did that. It, it's almost the day I woke up, you see nurses going, ah, what a 
that was like, like, <laughs> it was weird. Yeah. So then what you want to do is go home, but, but, but you can't. But you can't. Right? You, you, you think, fuck it, I'll just get off this table and get off this bed and just go. And you get you fall on the ground, you realize you can't even stand up. You don't even have the strength to move yourself up. You realize that you're emaciated. I was lighter than I remembered. Uh, and then by the time they're not giving you video calls of your wife, and you're like, shit, I got married again. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, she's pretty and everything, but nah, you should have told me. Yeah, you know? Then you see your kids and you remember them as little kids. But now you're seeing these grown fucking people on the yeah. phone crying. You're like, what's happening? So crazy experience coming out. But then... When you get out of that now, you have to remember your brain again is weird because it believes everything that it used to believe. You know, I'm 124 kg monster nigga. I can carry like three sacks of potatoes this side, three sacks of potatoes this side. I can run upstairs. Uh, I mean, I've always been very proud of my physical abilities to fuck niggas up. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm a rugby player guy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm combative like that. But I'm at my weakest ever. I can't, I can't open a boot. I can't open a car door. I'm weak as death. Uh, I can't climb up the stairs. So my mother-in-law and my wife are lifting. This is to me a guy who's now 110 kg. I've lost 20-something kgs. Yeah. And I'm trying to walk up these stairs. I can't walk. My daughter saw me and burst out crying and ran away. My baby daughter. Yeah. And I got a pregnant wife and all these things. So it was a hectic wow. you know, layer of having to just improve and improve. And, and the improvement is painful. My God, it's painful. You know, you got um, physiotherapists, uh, bardo trauma there, and they're just trying to make you do simple things like just walk up a step and down and over, and you're just in agony, right? And it's, and this is it just doesn't feel like it's um it's ever gonna go away. But however, it's it's the day that you start you discover oh, shit. I just walked from here to the gate and I didn't feel, you know, totally bad. You yeah. shit. All those little micro steps start to add up to Again. something, yeah. right? And that's when I started really believing in atomic habits, right? Because honestly, if I just slept out, it just died away, right? But it's just wait, forcing yourself to wake up, forcing yourself to do the exercises, forcing yourself, today you can pull one, tomorrow you can pull once and a little bit, the next day you can now pull twice, and you just seeing your progress uh, is a motivator, and seeing yeah. yourself really get better and better and being able to walk better and talk better. Uh, to the day when I managed to catch a young jog after about eight months, I was so, you know, I cried because I was so ecstatic <laughs> that I yeah. feel like I'm, but look, I'm not anyway close to back where I was. I don't think I'm nearly as strong as I was, uh, but my, my mental faculties remain, thank God, um, and my memories have all sort of returned. Yeah. Um, I still have chile in the legs and stuff like that, so I can't do what I used to do. I can't, by nine o'clock, I'm tired as death, like, so I can't club all night like I used to. I can't drink like I used to. You know, you come out, you're diabetic because yeah. of all the, uh, homo the hormones and therapies and, and, and steroids and stuff. So I'm now pretty much on insulin. and, and um, So I, I can't eat the cakes I used to enjoy. Yeah. Uh, that, that must suck, man. It sucks, re it, it sucks, it sucks really bad. Um, but you know what? We, we, you know, what? What I do thank God for is that I'm alive, right? Yeah. And uh, it's those little steps. So every day I must continue with those little steps to make sure that I get to full strength. Uh, and just encourage people that, you know what, if, if I had known what I was going to go through through COVID, there's things that I would have done 10 years before, before I got to 40, right? Yeah. Um, I would have kept my weight way down. I would have looked after my blood pressure and, you know, eaten less crap and, you know, yeah. <laughs> drunk less and shit. Because those are the kind of things that eventually now it's like, they catch up with you fast. I wish they caught up with me when I was 80, but they actually yeah. caught up with me in my 40s. Like, yeah. where I was like 40 and then bang, I can't walk, I can't talk, I'm too heavy, I'm all these kind of things. So, yeah. I'm a big advocate of letting people like yourselves, right? Just look after yourselves, right? Because yeah. you, you are literally one health crisis away from destitution. It cost my family 25,000 yeah. bucks to keep me alive. And that's... <laughs> and a lot of people simply don't have... Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. we didn't have that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. It doesn't matter what your company is making. I'm not going to be able to do that. You know what I'm saying? It's not your money, right? So, so we didn't have the money. Uh, and it really put our business under a lot of strain because well, as far as cash flow is concerned, the easiest thing was to do was to take money out of the business to keep me alive. You know, other people, random strangers gave money. You know, this is the, the testimony that random strangers not only prayed for me, but some of them donated money to keep me 
alive, bro. Yeah. It's weird, That's right? Yeah. So <laughs> no, no matter what sort of, no matter what people say about, you know, your cautious character or whatever else, whatever, whatever, yo, my nigga, like, you know what? I, w I woke up to 100,000 messages in my phone, yeah. on WhatsApp, on Twitter of, of random. People I've never met. People, people till today who I can be walking around in body. Like, ah, oh, Mr. Bigoda son, the whole number till I'm done. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's the weirdest thing. So with that comes a lot of responsibility. Yeah. You know, you don't, I don't walk around anymore thinking that what I say doesn't matter. Uh, you know, because I was sometimes very reckless to things I said and things I did and so forth. I, it, you know, when you're in the public eye like that, loved or hated, you have a lot of responsibility in what yeah. you do and what you say. Yeah. Um, and that's what I've been trying really to do in my life now is to be very conscious that, you know what, uh, yes, you, you like to be free and you're not anyone's role model and <laughs> fuck them, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you, there are people looking up to you. Why, nigga, I have a... I'm a lager loud, I swear a lot, why are you up to me? But they are there, and, and you gotta, uh, and, and, and learn to give more. And so, maybe God was actually, in a strange way, rewarded me with life because of the simple things I did in my, at my worst, you know what I'm saying? After going through the bad divorce and all these crazy things that were happening, you know, yeah. there were still, like, kids that we adopted and sent to school, to university, like, 23 kids that we were paying for, yeah. uh, you know, these bringing people into our homes with my wife and just they live with us like family and then we don't even they're strangers but they're people who didn't have and this is just I guess life lessons from my parents and so forth so I did it using muscle memory it wasn't like I'm a nice guy it just sort of it's just what instinctive you know. it's what I know but maybe God is rewarding me for that so I always say to people look don't be afraid to give of yourself because you never know when those blessings spit <laughs> back bro it's yeah. weird <laughs> I, I should look better people than me died of COVID yeah. Saints. <laughs> my brother Francis Nyati, for example, is church elder, great guy, gentle giant, beautiful yeah. guy, you know, chartered accountant, lovely family. Daughters were at the same school as mine at Arundel, great guy. Got COVID, died. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, SB Moyo with all his money, died. You know, Biggie Matiza was in hospital with me in St. Anne's with all his cash, yeah. died. So, you know, you never know. It's, yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> Sorry to make it so, so no, deep. No, 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 no. Uh, it is what it is. That's just what it is. Yeah. That's, that's just how it happened, isn't it? And, and there's, there's something that you, you tweeted. I mean, you tweet a lot, but this, like, stayed with me. Um, yeah. I'm basically going to paraphrase, but what it was, it was about uh, making better decisions earlier in your life that was like the crux of the tweet yeah. right and let's speak about that briefly like what are some of the things that younger you could have done better and i know like you're not a role model i don't think of myself as a role model to anyone that's a heavy, a heavy burden good, yeah. to carry right uh, but there are obviously things that you see when you introspect and i see this a lot when i talk to like older people yeah. they have a lot of things that they kind of wish they maybe hadn't done had done what's what's that for you um Look, okay, uh, let's start with uh, finances. Uh, yeah. You just break it down the stages. Right? So financially, all those niggas who are calling you big homie you're buying drinks for at Londoners no longer exist in my life. Yeah. Didn't even check up on you when you were sick. Didn't call your wife to see how your kids are doing, right? Um, so people who you think matter right now definitely may not matter in 10, 20 yeah. years' time. Right? 15, 15. So, so be careful what you sacrifice for those people. Because they're not gonna last forever, right? And, I, and and if I if I go back in time and take back some of the money, because I'm as a young man, I made a lot of cash. <laughs> yeah. well, the money you're buying drinks and trying to be the big man, and you know, sponsoring yeah. people's fuels and going drawn to you know South Africa and so forth. If I could take all that money back and put it in a pot for my mom, who's now retiring, right? Yeah. I would have done a better thing. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, than spending it and being frivolous, you know. Um, so it's on the financial level is you just be careful while you spend money be careful and, and maybe I guess mix the finances with friends be careful who these people you who you think are going to be there forever because they're just they're not um, you know when it comes to relationships you know take you know take don't take relationships for granted right yeah. uh, I woke up out of my out of my coma and good friends good colleagues Karen Blue Ayo, had died you know people who you wish I texted her last week and I said I should, I should have met up, but I didn't bother. Um, you know, uh, you know, um, tea with my mom once a week, twice a week. You know, she's seventy now. Jeez, you know, let's uh, 
you know, I don't want to miss her. I, I rather enjoy her now, yeah. you know, because she could have missed me as a son. I could have died. And, yeah. You know, it's not it's about her, it's about me. Yeah. So you really uh, be, be, be very, um, what, what do we call it, wife? We call it be very intentional on your relationships and can keeping the people who are good to you, good with them and be and, and nurture these relationships. Spend time yeah. with your, your family, your friends and, and, and enjoy life, right? Don't, don't um, spend all your life chasing money or chasing bitches or chasing this, chasing that, not realizing that, you know, you don't live forever. So there's a lot of things that I wish I'd done better in my life uh, growing up, you know. Yeah. Um, there's a time when uh, one of my friends at, at uni uh, said to me, oh, no, there's this white paper by a guy named um, Shitoshi about a new <laughs> currency called Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, I said, it's PayPal? I'm, nah, it's not like PayPal. It's like a decentralized crypto or whatever. I said, ah, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it, was, it, was two, it was two pence a Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> I, I could have bought a thousand Bitcoins and not blinked. Uh, but I, didn't, I, wasn't willing to, I wasn't willing to get out of my, I don't like numbers, I don't like, you know. I wasn't willing to get out of my comfort zone to understand something that ended up becoming very, very big. Yeah. Uh, and so I really regret some of those decisions, you know, where you, we saw certain things happen and we just sort of didn't act on, act on them in the right <laughs> time, right? Uh, and I wish I had, uh, especially now being in the country that I am. If I had jumped, if I had understood crypto the way I do now back then, I, I could have done a lot of amazing things before I, I even came back to Zim from, yeah. my, from my time at uni. And I was doing computer science, and I totally just looked and said, nah, nigga, this nigga, <laughs> never gonna catch on, nigga, this blockchain, never, not a million years. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, those are some of the things. So, just be, be intentional with relationships, watch what you spend on, watch your people around you, you know, and, 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 and try and be a good person, you know, try and be a good person so that you don't have to ever look over your shoulder and say, I fucked over somebody. You try and be a good person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I'm going to ask something, and this is more like even a, a personal question for me because this is something I've been battling with mm. more of late is uh, in terms of like uh, relationships, like the one you have with your wife, like romantic relationships. Mm. Like, how has that helped you? So I ask this because... Um, our generation is kind of fucked, isn't it? Like, our view of that institution is a bit messed up. Mess like, up. I'll, I'll speak for myself. I don't have that much faith in the institution. Like, mm. how's that helped you in your journey? Maybe that could, like, help a number of people I know. So, so I'm, 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 I'm quite a weird character because my, my generation was one that used to write letters and it would take a week to get to your girlfriend and she would write a letter back and, and so on yeah. and so forth, right? So, like I said, I'm a digital immigrant. Um, so in my first marriage, I was, I was my ex-wife was 14 years old, uh, and, we, and after 25 years, we still divorced, right? Uh, she yeah. still left me, right? <laughs> um, and and then, then I got remarried to Norma, and, and, and our marriage is, is, is a lot more solid. It's a lot more, because initially, we, we sort of agreed to, to get into this relationship on a lot of truth, right? Yeah. So... Let, let us know every n terrible thing that's happened in the past, every terrible ex, every bad decision you made, whatever else, so you can make an informed decision when we get together. And then be very intentional about making sure you, you, you nurture and build that relationship. And it's, you know, so I'm a big faith, I'm a faith, I'm a big solid guy on, on, on finding the right partner and, 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 and building with the right partner. So, like I said, I'm a weird guy because I'm the sort of guy who they had two serious relationships in my life, and, and I've married both. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm 44 this year, right? So, uh, uh, so uh, what, what I say to the younger generation is this: I, I think be careful where you lend your soul, because it's very hard to claw back your your your, your soul, right? So. Anyone who you put in your bed, anyone who you share your, your life with or share your moments with, whatever else, that person takes a little bit of, away from you, right? And uh, if you cheapen relationships and cheapen sex and cheapen things to, 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 to become what they are, cookie cutter, throw away relationships, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it will be very hard for the next generation to, to be able to... Um, to have serious, lifelong, uh, life-changing relationships. And when I look at the most successful societies in the world, um, family is a big, solid crux of, um, of why they're successful. 
So you look at the, Jew, the, the Jewish community, look at the Muslim community, look at, you know, look at some of the American, in the Deep South community, some of the mm. richest families. Uh, like it's about family. And when you look at the communities not doing great, it's the communities that there's a lot of single mothers, a lot of absentee fathers, a lot of deadbeat dads, yeah. a lot of let's look up to rappers and, 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 and influencers <laughs> and athletes and stupidness and not, not building strong family values, right? Yeah. So as, as a conservative at heart, and a libertarian, I say, you know what, let's be, be very conscious and be purposeful with the people you choose to partner with. Uh, if you think it's going to be a Hollywood fucking movie and it's going to be romantic mm -hmm. and you look great in the morning and there's no, no farting in bed, you're wrong. <laughs> it doesn't work like that, right? Yeah. You, you, you're definitely dealing with another human being. And there is, you know, and partnering up and pairing up and being able to work together does absolutely take away from take a, a large burden away. If, I, if it wasn't for my wife, after I came out from being sick, I would have literally been, I would have died, yeah. right? That's how deep it is, right? So, uh, and, and the fact that she, she was there to pick up the slack so much, and now, you know, as her star is rising, I can also pick up, you know, there's things that I'm good at that I can help bolster her up and we can continue to lift each other up. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing. So don't lose faith in the institution of family and marriage and stuff. It's a, yeah. it's a beautiful institution. Just don't cheapen yourself or cheapen the people that you're with to being just, you know, uh, bangs or whatever. They, they actually are people and it's important uh, for our black communities worldwide and our Zimbabwean communities to remember that families will be the, the reason why we rise out of this quagmire that we're in. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have to be very conscious as black males, especially, yeah. about being fathers and being there for our children and making sure that we build a better generation to take over from us. Because without strong families, we wouldn't be here. You know, our grandfathers, our grandmothers, and their great grandfathers, their great the family's always been a big thing, you know. And as, and as, and as Zimbabweans, we're blessed. We have Mutupos, we have totemic uh, relationships, we have families around. We, have, we can build really solid. We could become the Jews of the world if we wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we prove this every year by you know, sort of remitting $10 billion worth of money <laughs> back home. Like, if Zimbabweans got together, yeah. there's a billion things we could sort out. We would not be on Twitter complaining about cancer machines because we can yeah. afford to buy them. Yeah. We can afford to build more hospitals. We can, as Zimbabweans, right? And it's not like even a government thing. It's about strong family institutions. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. So I'm going to touch on one more thing as we, as we close off. Mm. And <clears throat> it's not as personal as what we've just been speaking about. It's more business. But um, yeah. when you started Fresh Ideas, there's a, there's a... Not when you started, but last year, actually, there's a... Zoom uh, meeting we were on, and you were talking about um, angel investment at the start of your business and whatnot, and yeah. you were saying uh, you turned down some money. Um, yeah. And that's not in vogue, because what's in vogue, what people are exposed to right now is VC, like the VC culture, take yeah. money, turn that money into this, that, and yeah. why did you turn down, turn down the money? Like, what was your thinking then? Um, I turned down the money because <laughs> if you look at the Zimbabwean history in tech, and you look at every single tech startup competition, every single tech grant that's been given, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm going to go on a limb and say none of those companies exist anymore. Yeah. I, I don't care what it is. I mean, I've we've heard many great ideas and stuff, but now they took the money and they just failed to, to scale up, failed to grow their businesses. The reason why Fresh in the Box exists till today is because when people like MK, who's a juggernaut in the software industry in Zimbabwe. I mean, all the banks are using his code. Uh, you know, he, he's going to be rich forever and ever. I mean, because to change his systems is, costs way more than just to keep him on the books, right? Um, when you get a guy like that and you have his ear and you can go to his house and you can call him, you can WhatsApp him. I was with him yesterday, for example. Yeah. That kind of guy will keep your business going forever, right? He's just giving you counsel, telling you when you're fucking up, telling you when not to do this, and, you know, this business is a good one, this is a bad one, you know, giving you solid counsel. So, I got more than money from MK. I mean, eventually, I took his money. Um, yeah, you, yeah. Did you actually did say that initially you refused. I refused his money. Like you said, yeah. if you're willing to be a mentor and you're willing to, to, to walk me through this, I have no clue when I really need hand-holding, you know. Yeah. And there's many of these mentors, you know. Uh, one of my big Nkomas, a Greek guy who owns a lot of, um, you know, a lot of Zimbabwe's businesses and stuff. I sit with him all the time. He's never given me a penny, but 
my God, I mean, I'm, you know, our businesses thrive today because of a little note. He, he started a little black notebook. I don't remember my if you remember a little black notebook. And he gave me like 10 rules. And every time with me, she would write notes in these things. So I'm, how do you do stock control? How do you manage this? How do you make money? You know, yeah. you, you either you either squeeze your supplier, you, 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 you cut down your expenses, or you squeeze your customers. You know, all these weird like gems I get. And he's an eccentric guy, you know, <laughs> doesn't shave. And he, you know what I mean? But every time I'm working with that notebook, I'm like, shit, we got another million dollars from this guy. Right? So some of these guys are very, very knowledgeable. And, and they're quiet. Again, it's about these quiet, unassuming people. And I keep meeting more and more of these people who uh, are more valuable to us uh, as, as young business people coming up um, that, than the, the money they throw at us. So I'm trying very, very hard to make sure. And I, I assure you, we have, we, have had, we have been so visible. I mean, we're BBC, CNN, you name it. Like, yeah. We've been so visible. We could have raised yeah. many millions in, in VC. <laughs> But would have been taking people's money for nothing and just burning it away and not being able to. Uh, and, and, and I always say to wife, if we can't see how we return, if someone says, I want to give you investment for equity, if we can't see how this person is going to get value out of the company, we shouldn't take it. Zimbabwe politics, perturbations, nonsense, changes of rules and so forth, a lot of the money we would have taken from externals would have been wasted yeah. uh, because the rules have changed so much. So we've tried to make sure that we keep our company uh, in the family, uh, tightly run, with a lot of great advisors. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, if you go online right now, you'll see a bunch of these. I mean, look, we compared to some guys, and, I, you know, we compared to every clone that came up after us, right? Yeah. They're all dead. Um, <laughs> we, we, none of them exist anymore, right? The, you know, when we launched the Fresh Ideas stores, for example, we were, there was a big write-up on TechZem about all the other, all of, I mean, First of all, they, these guys didn't write their own code. They're just stealing other people's stuff. And none of them exist anymore, right? Yeah. Uh, let, we we got to run our companies with a lot more ethics as, as young entrepreneurs. Getting VC cash and burning it and spending it and living large is now too easy. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, that VC cash is what created this millennial paradox, this is the, the, par the, the millennial subsidy where companies started doing deliveries of ironing shirts and all these kind of things and free this and free yeah, this yeah. and all these VCs were just now, blah, 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 blah. there's a lot of unnecessary they, they're dead companies. now they're dead I mean we have four taxi companies in Zimbabwe claiming to be Zimbabwe's Uber Uber's never made a fucking profit why are we there's bothering that. There's, that. there's no way of monetizing that nonsense it's, it's right? crazy I wrote about that <laughs> I wrote about that three years ago <laughs> on TechZim and I was like 21 and I'm like dog how do I see this do these guys not see this or do they see this and they, they don't get they just want vc those cash grants and whatnot it's it's, yeah, it's tough eh? it's a confusing time it's a confusing it's a time very confusing where, time. where people have more money than sense yeah. so you come up with a great dot com idea and we've seen this see that's what i'm saying i'm a digital immigrant i've seen this before <laughs> right there's a time when sadly i mean there's a time when guys could come up with a dot com so like um online mic dot com right yeah. And it'll be like, write a white paper, say, this will be an online mic where you can use your voice online and all these kind of things. Like, you didn't have to prove a concept. It's like money. a holding page. Yeah. And you get millions of dollars. Yeah. And in the 2000s, my guy, the dot-com bubble burst and we yeah. witnessed it. We watched guys in Ferraris jump off cliffs. <laughs> I saw this in my life. Yeah. Now, and sadly, you guys are probably babies. So I've yeah, seen this yeah, before. 2000. Yeah. I was like, what, three? Three. Oh, yeah. They're babies. <laughs> right? So, and then 2008, we saw people move into real estate. And again, everyone said real estate is a sound investment, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, at 2008, I sold my first house in London, right? In, yeah. in Essex, right? I sold it in August. By December, the housing went boom. And it crashed again. Like, oh, shit. Yeah. You know, speculative thoughts again. So when, when it comes to the VC thing, I, I saw that as well. Like, my gosh, you can... You can blag a good idea and niggas will pump in cash yeah. and it ends up being nothing. Serious amounts of money. Crypto, NFTs, uh, yeah. it will keep going. There's more <laughs> money than sense. If you want a business that you're going to last for, that's going to last forever, really work on the sound business principles, put in great systems, make sure that you can see the profitability pipeline and then take people's money knowing that they're going to extract real value from that because then you'll last forever. Um, yeah. And I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about things that are new, it's a new concept. It's what the communities are talking about before, the Jewish, the Muslim, the, you know, yeah. the, 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 that's these white communities. That's how they've been doing each other for ages. 
They advise each other. They grow each other's businesses. They give each other, you know, uh, loans. They give each other concessions, and they grow these. And they become old money. And I'm hoping that my son's son will say my grandfather did the right thing. Yeah, because yeah, we still own everything. That's yeah. That's that's a, that's a great <laughs> place to finish off, man. It's been it's been great chatting to you. Great fun. Thank you very much for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, well done on what you're doing, man. It's just lovely to see young black people doing good. Yeah. Ownership. Ownership, <laughs> man. Ownership. Bless up. Yeah, let's see how it goes. Thanks. Cheers, man.